you're okay, I'll yeah. introduce you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's occasional lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. And this week, you will have noticed coming up the hill to Parliament House that it's NAIDOC week. And we thought this was an appropriate time to uh, turn our, our gaze to the prospect of constitutional change and constitutional recognition of Indigenous people. And to help us today, we are very pleased to have Professor Megan Davis with us. Uh, Megan is Director of the Indigenous Law Centre and Professor of Law at the Faculty of Law, University of New South Wales. And she's also an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, she holds portfolios including Women and Gender and Administration of Justice. She's a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, an Acting Commissioner of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, a member of the New South Wales Sentencing Council, and she was a member of the expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the Constitution. And still so young as well, lucky yeah. Megan. I'm still young. Um, in my job as, as Clerk of the Senate, I suppose the two things I, um, I have at my closest at my hand are my Constitution, which I've used a fair bit this week, and my standing <laughs> orders. Um, but, but the question of, of changing the constitution, we know it's a, it's, it's a difficult task and uh, proposals to include indigenous recognition in the constitution have, gone, have, have been around for quite some time, but we haven't quite got there yet. So um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome Megan to the podium today to speak to us about some of the reasons for that and some of the, the threads in, in the dialogue that will lead us there eventually. Please welcome Professor Megan. Thank you, Rosemary. I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples as the, as the traditional uh, custodians of Canberra, of the Canberra area, uh, owners of the country that we meet on today. I'd also like to convey my warm regards um, to Rosemary, Tim, Ophelia and those who helped um, organise um, my lecture today. It's indeed a privilege uh, to speak in this the week of NAIDOC, one of the most important uh, cultural weeks for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, and the topic somewhat um, fitting, of course, constitutional recognition. Uh, by way of opening comment, um, as a lawyer, I've been intimately involved in the development of the current iteration of constitutional recognition as a member of the uh, former Prime Minister's expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Australian Constitution. And uh, prior to that, I had written extensively on constitutional reform and Indigenous peoples, which includes my doctoral thesis, where I explore the importance of a constitutional right to equality for Aboriginal women. Last week I was here in Canberra, as I often am, with my uh, former expert panel colleague and close friend Henry Burmester QC, and uh, we were uh, presenting to lawyers at uh, the Australian Government Solicitor, and we were reflecting on the fact that um, it is now 2014 and we've been giving exactly the same speech for about four years uh, since the panel handed its recommendations to the Prime Minister in, in January of uh, 2012, um, and four years is a long time. And Henry and I were reflecting on the fact that the much anticipated report of the current Joint Select Committee on Constitutional uh, uh, Recognition will be very useful in focusing or refocusing the current, although relatively faint for now, public discourse on constitutional recognition. I note on Wednesday, the ABC ran a story about a growing Aboriginal resistance to recognition. And in last week, or the week before Spectator, um, uh, the issue attracted a somewhat uh, spiteful commentary on the supporters of Recognise, uh, co consolidating thinking around options for reform is critical to sharpening the debate uh, 
and, and tempering uh, overblown allegations that such reform undermines Aboriginal claims to sovereignty or undermines uh, the right to equality for all Australians or that it will lead to the reintroduction of child brides or Aboriginal spearing. In light of, of this, rather than approaching today's lecture as um, uh, one normally would do in a conventional sense, and that is to speak about the expert panel's recommendations, although I will refer to them, I wanted to approach uh, the current uh, uh, recognition iteration from a different perspective or through an alternative lens, and that is to attempt to capture uh, both historically and in a contemporary sense the competing notions of constitutional recognition, uh, that of the state uh, and that of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, uh, because one can see uh, that beginning to play out in, as I said, the faint but growing public discussion on this issue, and I think it can be amplified in a, in a negative way when there is no actual model for people uh, to debate and discuss. And, uh, I mean, one is reluctant to and, uh, or hesitant to, um, I suppose, ventilate these competing notions, but I don't want to shy away um, from the fact that they exist. I don't think by speaking about them that we detract or it should detract from the importance of the, the contemporary task of constitutional recognition of Aboriginal people. As an expert panel member and an Aboriginal person and a constitutional lawyer, I support constitutional recognition and reform wholeheartedly, subject to a model. What I suppose I didn't see as an expert uh, panel member, um, or none of us could have seen, um, is how these competing notions, ideas, motivations are playing out, how they intersect, overlap, reinforce, conflict, or indeed sometimes cancel each other out. I'm currently in the process of writing a, a, a new book on constitutional recognition with Professor George Williams, and, I, and, and so this lecture, I suppose, is um, my unrehearsed thoughts um, uh, that are emerging as, as, as we write um, this book. I think we ought to, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, come to understand that these competing notions of recognition exist and understand why they exist. And I certainly do not make claim to any definitive or exhaustive explanation of them, but if we come to understand these uh, competing sentiments, then we can proceed uh, with integrity and not be sidelined by petty irritations. This lecture will map uh, chronologically and somewhat discursively, for which I beg your indulgence, uh, these competing beliefs. First of all, the expert panel and the current process didn't emerge from nowhere. Uh, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is part of a historical trajectory in this country. Secondly, mapping this trajectory out is an important exercise because if 1967 was a form of recognition, which I believe it was, why are we back here? The answer to that question is complicated. It is likely that the state as the recognisor and Indigenous peoples as the recognised are back here, uh, motivated, informed by divergent forces. For example, the starting point for mainstream conversations in Australia on constitutional reform is always, by necessity, the notorious double majority that plagues constitutional evolution in Australia. Yet for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, it is an inescapable proposition that the recognition project and or the model of recognition should be understood apropos the question of justice and redress. That is to say, the starting point for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is what is fair and what is just. Unfinished business, foremost in the minds of the community, and somewhat of a utilitarian calculus in the minds of the state. 
The relatively crude exercise of calculating reform on the basis of what minor inoffensive gesture is likely to receive uh, bipartisan support and thus automate a majority of states and a national majority is of course at odds with the question of fairness and justice. Because that agenda that indigenous peoples themselves um, have mapped out over 50, 60 years is, is an agenda that is quite formidable. If one is to consider the concept of what is fair and just in regard to constitutional recognition, uh, and I'm not sure uh, the community is convinced that that is the case in this current iteration, equity cannot be viewed solely through the eyes of the state. It needs to be considered through the eyes of the people who have been dispossessed, uh, disempowered, a people who are still grieving a loss, who feel deeply, uh, sincerely, that they have been wronged and for which there has been no resolution. The historical uh, trajectory since 1967 is an essential part of this story of Indigenous constitutional reform and recognition as it animates why Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are likely not to accept a mere symbolic gesture when it comes to constitutional recognition. And by mere symbolic gesture, I mean things like a 1999 style preamble, um, or indeed deletion of section 25 and section 5126, because they mention the word race, the literature reveals to us that indeed from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective, we are back here because of a technical problem with the text of the constitution. We are back here for reform rather than recognition in a strict sense. Still, that reform agenda, amendment or appeal of section 5126 was accepted by the expert panel as a type or form of recognition. If anything, and I should start because I only have 40 minutes left now, um, this lecture explores how this current recognition project carries with it a confluence of ideas that if not made more coherent by leadership, meaning concrete options for discussion and debate, it risks confusing the public. So I suggest that the historical trajectory of the current project can be viewed through three phases. First, the post-1967 referendum era, then the reconciliation era, um, in which in particular I will draw upon two um, uh, uh, high court uh, decisions, but the reconciliation era in particular saw the consolidation of Indigenous people's notions of recognition, and then the post-1999 referendum recognition era, where state notions of recognition really start to take shape. So that is the order I will follow. In my comments, I will interchange recognition with reform. While recognition is the word um, adopted by the state, the recognisor, it is the case, however, that in a textual sense anyway, the word does tend to convey the image of a weaker form of constitutional recognition. So it tends to obfuscate. And I suppose for many in the Indigenous community, a fear that it excavates Indigenous aspirations or indigenous visions of equity of their substantive features. Uh, for that reason, I interchange it with reform. So to begin with, the post-67 referendum period, a few comments here about the re 1967 referendum. I do agree with scholars such as John Chesterman, Brian Galligan, Atwood and Marcus about the mythology of 1967 and overstating the significance of it. There is an over-reliance on the so-called popular movement or campaign as the primary driver of that success. We know that the key factor was bipartisan support. The evidence tells us that the state can succeed in virtually anything at referendum if bipartisan support is there, although one um, knows that Australian, <laughs> the nature of Australian history is, is it's, that may not be the case in the future. 
Uh, significantly, um, bipartisan support was related to external factors, important geopolitical factors that exerted pressure on the Australian polity, including an international normative shift to racial non-discrimination and equality at the United Nations. And that was relevant to Australia's international reputation um, when that mattered. Keep in mind that at the time, uh, Aboriginal people lived in subhuman conditions in reserves and missions around the country. This was the tail end of the protection era, the protection era that was preceded by the frontier period or what's known as the killing times, um, a period that is celebrated this week or acknowledged this week um, as, as a theme of NAIDOC. Um, and was a period when states and territories regulated the lives of Aboriginal people. Uh, their freedom of speech, freedom of movement, right to marry, right to have an income, et cetera, et cetera. So these geopolitical forces were critical to that bipartisan support. In addition, as my colleague and co-author, Professor George Williams has argued, more time and energy was spent on the nexus question. Uh, the Aboriginal question not as prominent, in fact, he argues the nexus question attracted so much negativity that uh, he speculates it aided the success of the Aboriginal question. Um, and this explains why some are attracted to running a recognition referendum at the same time as an election. So the ballot box attracts the negativity. That's all I wanted to say about 67. What's significant though, is that it provided the federal parliament with constitutional authority to make laws for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And this ushered in a new era of law and policy making. Well, certainly not at first, because the initial response of the Commonwealth Parliament was to continue to defer to the states and not use the race power. Indeed, the evidence reveals that for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the elation of 1967 quickly dissipated with a dawning realisation but that perhaps the state was not going to use Section 5126 to pursue the political agenda that they had hoped for. So, the election of the Whitlam government in 1972, and I think it's Gough Whitlam's birthday today, I thought, well, I think people were saying on Twitter this morning, um, and Twitter never lies. Um, the election of the Whitlam government saw a new era of law and policy uh, begin. So it resulted in a number of uh, initiatives aimed at improving the plight of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and this included the establishment of the Land Commission headed by Justice Woodward, uh, the use of the constitutional authority granted in 1967 to establish Aboriginal legal services, Aboriginal medical services, and of course, eventually, um, the commission led to uh, Aboriginal land rights being granted in the Northern Territory um, by statute under the Fraser government. Whitlam also ratified the International Convention on the Elimination of, of All Forms of Ra Racial Discrimination and legislated for the Racial Discrimination Act, an act that was to become the single most important statute for Indigenous peoples in their continuing fight against racial discrimination and for equality, and the RDA remains so today. As Noel Pearson has written of the significance of this act uh, uh, as um, enacted by uh, the Whitlam government, he said, at the level of legal policy at least, we were at last free from those discriminations that humiliated and degraded our people. The Whitlam legislation meant freedom. So in, a, in this historical trajectory, I'm trying to take you on two significant things there, the RDA extremely important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their rights. And the use now of section 5126 reveals the potential of this head of power to achieve redress, self-determination, um, a promise that it will achieve the political agenda that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples had determined for themselves. Next. Uh, of course, as we all know, following a double disillusion election in 1975, the Fraser government was elected. Uh, important here in the historical trajectory towards constitutional recognition is the establishment in 1977 of a new representative body, the National Aboriginal Conference. Uh, this was the first Aboriginal organisation to be incorporated under the Aboriginal Councils and Associations Act, 1976. Uh, supported by the raised power. And the NAC advocated on issues of sovereignty, 
land rights, the right to self-determination and racial non-discrimination. The work of NAC is significant here because it advocated for a treaty between Aboriginal people and the state as a way to resolve the unsettled issue of Aboriginal sovereignty. And through its work, it laid down the foundations uh, for this uh, through research and consultation with communities around Australia. And it led those discussions in 1979 around Australia, the advocacy in part influenced by the High Court's rejection of Aboriginal sovereignty in the decision in Coe in the Commonwealth, led by Aboriginal leader Paul Coe. This case challenged the sovereignty of the Commonwealth. The argument was rejected by Justice Gibbs and virtually the same month that the decision was handed down, the NAC announced its call for a treaty of commitment to be negotiated between Aboriginal people and the Commonwealth. In August 1979, the Fraser government replied to the NIC stating that they would examine the proposal for a treaty and participate in future discussions. The NAC resolved at its meeting in November 1979 to replace the word treaty with the word Makarata, um, which is a your new word um, um, uh, that has a number of interpretations, but essentially means um, uh, uh, cessation in a conflict. Um, to replace the word with treaty in response to concerns expressed by the government um, about the word treaty, and, and, and that uh, concern has been uh, revisited numerous times throughout Australian history. And the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at the time, Fred Cheney, um, a colleague of mine on the expert panel and, and good friend, welcomed this. During 1981, then, the NAC travelled around Australia consulting with communities. Their interim report laid out a, a vision um, um, of what it was that Indigenous peoples wanted of the state in particular with respect to the use of Section 5126. The report demanded recognition of Indigenous sovereignty, of course, and the recognition of Indigenous laws. It expressed a desire to negotiate land rights, including freehold title of all that land upon which Aboriginal people presently live. The subcommittee also argued for greater participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Australian political life. That included the reservation of parliamentary seats at a federal, state and local level, um, or designated parliamentary seats. Other proposals included the repatriation of Indigenous human remains and the teaching of Aboriginal culture in schools. The subcommittee also called for the abolition of statutes in any part of the Commonwealth that make the Aboriginal status different in any other way than that of other citizens. So in early 1981, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and the NAC exchanged letters about the issue of a Makarata, in which the minister encouraged the NAC to commence negotiations with the states, uh, critical to Australia's federal system. However, the NAC's work was hampered by a lack of funding, and in 1985, the Hawke Labor government uh, abolished the NAC. But it's important to pose and note that in this trajectory, the NAC plays a very important part, prominent to the ideas of the communities they consulted were treaty and sovereignty, through extensive consultations and substantive thinking about these issues. How could it be done in our constitution? How could it be done in this federation? Um, the one thing I would briefly note here is that um, with the abolition of the NAC, you can see that our history is littered with representative bodies, um, either set up by government, um, whether statutory or not, um, no doubt informing the decision of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples in choosing a corporate model, um, uh, uh, which after initial funding from government is, is, is meant to be or, uh, or to become self-sustaining. Um, and uh, we can talk later about the significance of the work of the National Congress today uh, in, in constitutional recognition. But I return to Hawke because Australia is now preparing to celebrate its bicentenary year. In preparation for this, the Hawke government establishes a new commission to review the Australian constitution called the Constitutional Commission. The final report of the, of the Commission was handed down in 1988 and it contained a number of recommendations on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution. The Commission recommended the deletion of Section 25 of the Constitution, 
arguing that it was no longer appropriate to include in the Constitution a provision which contemplates the disqualification of members of a race from voting. In addition, the committee, sorry, the Commission was concerned with the race power, section 5126, which had been amended in the 1967 referendum. The Commission noted that the Parliament could pass both special and discriminating laws that could be in favour or adverse, uh, prescient uh, in terms of this historical uh, trajectory. The Commission recommended a new paragraph that would authorise the Parliament to make laws with respect to Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. In addition, the Commission recommended the insertion of a racial non-discrimination clause titled Section 124G. You can see already for those who know uh, the expert panel's recommendations, they mirror very closely uh, the recommendations um, uh, of the Commission. The Commission also very seriously considered the treaty debate and examined the constitutional authority for an agreement between the Commonwealth and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. They weren't talking about some you know, pan-Aboriginal agreement. They were talking about negotiations uh, in uh, uh, individual uh, communities. Um, the uh, commission uh, built upon the work of the Senate Standing Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs in 1983, who had devised a section 105A uh, which, which was the insertion of a new constitutional provision for the power of the Commonwealth to enter into agreements with representatives of the Aboriginal people. It's important to note that the Commission noted that such a power could not be used until an agreement was already negotiated. So this work of the Constitutional Commission um, was and remains significant and was drawn upon by the expert panel. It is, after all, important that we don't keep reinventing uh, the wheel. Important for us, though, we have 1983, 1988, non-Indigenous state public institutions laying inte intellectual basis or constitutional basis for uh, a potential agreement-making power in the Constitution. And the Constitutional Commission identifies a non-discrimination clause as, an, as appropriate in a review of, of the Constitution, um, noting the potential discriminate, discriminatory impact of Section 5126. So continuing along this history, Australia celebrates its bicentenary in 1988, and during the celebrations, the Barunga Statement, two paintings and a text, was presented to Prime Minister Bob Hawke, which called upon the Commonwealth to use its authority under Section 5126 to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's right to self-determination, including a nationally elected organisation to oversee Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs, a national system of land rights, a police and justice system. It also called upon the Commonwealth Parliament to negotiate uh, a, a treaty recognising the prior ownership, continued occupation and sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and affirming Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples' human rights and freedom. In response, Bob Hawke said that there would be a treaty within his life of the parliament. Prime Minister Hawke was able to deliver on the Barunga Statement's call for a representative body um, and in 1989, the Parliament gave effect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, known as ATSIC. However, he was unable to deliver on two successive promises, one for national land rights and secondly for a treaty. For many political reasons that I won't ventilate in this paper, um, however, the in inability to deliver on these two issues important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples ushered in the next phase on this journey to constitutional reform, reconciliation. Now, it's important to note here that this is not a reconciliation as in the ventilating of stories, a truth and justice process, such as that which is common in many jurisdictions around the world, but reconciliation is a kind of political confection, as a compromise for reneging on those promises made to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. That might sound cynical, but it's certainly the view of many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. 
So we enter this reconciliation phase, this work led by the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, which was a, a statutory body, who had three uh, goals to achieve. One, create documents of reconciliation. Two, to develop partnerships in reconciliation. And three, to build a people's movement for reconciliation. So throughout the 1990s, we see this reconciliation movement grow, led by the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. However, before moving on from the reconciliation phase, you cannot understand the current iteration of constitutional recognition without contemplating two particular events or, to be more specific, decisions of the High Court. So I want to look at two things quickly. The aftermath of Mabo, the WIC decision, and the High Court decision in Cartonieri. Um, before we look to WIC, it's important to note that after the High Court's decision in Mabo, there was actually a three-tier response. The negotiation of a Native Title Act, the creation of a land fund for Indigenous people who could not benefit from Native Title, and third, what's known as a social justice package to be led by uh, the Council, uh, ATSIC, and the uh, HERIOC, or the Australian Human Rights Commission, as it's known today. This social justice package was aimed at addressing dispossession as a response to Mabo. The social justice report, recognition, rights, and reform uh, included ways in which the federal parliament could build, again, upon its post-1967 authority um, that was granted overwhelmingly to it by the people of Australia, um, to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, are more in the delivery of services and development of policies that affect their lives. So this included major institutional and structural change, including constitutional reform and recognition, including recognition of regional self-government and regional agreements, and the negotiation of a treaty or comparable document which must address the issue of compensation. So by the time that report was completed, there was a change of government and the new government declined to embrace the concept of the social justice package. But it's important for me to raise this because it was raised during the consultations that we did as an expert panel over, over, over seven months throughout Australia with communities. Every community around Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community I'm talking about, asked what had happened to the social justice package. It's important because it was the state's formal response to Mabo, and, but it also gives you an insight into what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples thought was an appropriate settlement uh, with respect to dispossession um, as, as recognised by the High Court. Um, and 15 years after the NAC, it was exactly the same thing. It was about some form of agreement to facilitate a settlement reconciliation and ultimately forgiveness with respect to dispossession. But let me park that and continue on. That the WIC decision was a very difficult step in, in terms of the reconciliation era. The High Court found that pastoral leases could coexist with native title on the extent of inconsistency. And I don't want to dwell on the vehement reaction from those sections of the um, Australian community who um, opposed WIC, um, except to say the racial tensions were so acute that some feared that there would be a race-based election. The negotiations for the Native Title Amendment Act were brutal. We know this because of the many leaders involved in these negotiations have written about it, have spoken extensively about it, um, in, uh, including on the 10-point plan that introduced a strict registration test for Aboriginal Native Title applicants, broader validation provisions and limited the right to negotiate for claimants and, um, um, and all of the many issues that continue to be rehearsed in the space of Native Title. But relevant to, for us today and relevant to the recognition project is this. The Native Title Amendment Act suspended the application of the Racial Discrimination Act that act that I referred to from the outset that has been so important, so integral to the rights and the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The Native Title Amendment Act suspended the application of the Racial Discrimination Act so that the government could adversely discriminate against Aboriginal Native Title claimants on the basis of their race. So in this case, reducing the rights of Native Title claimants and advancing the rights of other land holders. An amendment that the UN Committee overseeing this legislation determined was a clear-cut example 
of racial discrimination. But I won't um, dwell on the third committee um, because we know the opinion of UN committees get very little traction uh, in this polity. But it's not necessary for me to descend into forensic detail about the politics of this. The relevant point for this excursion is the way in which statute um, the way in which this RDA that Indigenous peoples rely upon so much is so easily suspended um, by the Commonwealth Parliament with barely, um, I think, a whimper um, from the Australian uh, uh, population. Um, every entity in Australia is bound by the principle of racial non-discrimination except for the Federal Parliament. The next significant challenge is the High Court's decision in Cartonieri in 1998. So one of the first acts of the new government in 1996 was to pass legislation under Section 5126, the raised power, uh, uh, that was amended in 67, to deny the Naranjeri Aboriginal women from using the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act to prevent the construction of a bridge over an area that encompassed what the women uh, asserted was secret women's business. This act, the Hindmarsh Island Bridge Act, suspended the racial discrimination from operating with respect to this legislation so that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act applied everywhere in the country except for Hindmarsh Island. So here, contemporaneously to WIC, the Racial Discrimination Act is being suspended in order to discriminate in an adverse fashion against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, this legislation was challenged by the Naranjeri women in the High Court on the basis that the race power as amended in 67 couldn't be used in an adverse or detrimental manner by the Commonwealth. The High Court split on whether the race power could be used to discriminate against Indigenous peoples. The judgment was uh, inconclusive and left open the possibility that the Commonwealth still possesses the power to enact racially discriminatory laws. However, as the expert panel found, it's almost universal legal consensus that the race power does permit adverse discriminatory legislation. But this decision was a turning point in that post-1967 Aboriginal advocacy, the prospect that the federal parliament, the very parliament that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples had put their faith in post-1967, had the power to make laws that discriminate in a negative way against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I refer to those two cases because we must recall that these two events, um, or we must recall these two events, if we had to fully contemplate the motivation for a non-discrimination clause in the Constitution. Not as some ambit claim for a Bill of Rights for Aboriginal people, but uh, you know, a reasonable and unremarkable response to the majoritarian tendencies of the Australian polity. Before moving on, it's important to note that um, we were quite taken, especially uh, myself as an Aboriginal lawyer, by the, um, the memories of these two decisions in the High Court uh, in communities during our expert panel consultations. The, 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 these two cases uh, were cited and are alive and well in community narratives um, about the state. Before I wrap up, uh, the reconciliation phase, um, it's important here uh, to note that we begin to understand recognition from the, pers from the, from the perspective of the, of the recognise or the state. Uh, in many way, ways, it departs here from entertaining Indigenous claims. So during the second term of the Howard government, we see um, uh, this new phase of reconciliation, and that is the potential uh, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the preamble of the Constitution as a part of a broader referendum on the Republic. Uh, Prime Minister Howard himself took lead in drafting a new preamble leading up to the 1999 referendum, uh, which included uh, Indigenous recognition. The eventual vote in, in the referendum, of course, uh, saw the preamble rejected by every state and territory and nationally by 60.7%. The recognition especially pronounced in electorates with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. The significance of recalling this, however, is not to rehearse the controversies associated with the language that was chosen. Um, but it's to make this point that after decades of advocacy for recognition of Indigenous rights, uh, the political agenda that I have 
uh, described to you in part, set out or laid down by communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, had been cherry picked by the state. Uh, and by 1998 gave singular prominence to recognition in the preamble. We pinpoint this as, as a point where um, the state and, and, and Indigenous ideas about recognition uh, diverged. Um, uh, so structural form, making space, giving way to mere recognition or, or poetry as it's so disparagingly referred to in communities. So following the failed uh, referendum, the nation moved towards the final chapter of the reconciliation era and in its final recommendations to the Australian government, the council recommended uh, the following measures, that the Commonwealth Parliament prepare legislation for a referendum which seeks to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia in a new preamble. Uh, second, remove section 25 of the constitution. And thirdly, introduce a new section making it unlawful uh, to adversely discriminate against any people on the grounds of race. In addition, it suggested that every, or recommended that each government and parliament pass legislation that recognises that this land and its waters were settled as colonies without treaty or consent, and that to advance uh, reconciliation, it would be most desirable if there were agreements or treaties and to negotiate a process through which this might be achieved that protects the political, legal, cultural and economic position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Finally, it recommended that Commonwealth Parliament enact legislation to put in place a process which would unite all Australians by way of an agreement or treaty through which unresolved issues of reconciliation can be resolved. So that's the position 14 years ago that was the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. We then move into this post-1999 recognition phase, um, which continues with the advocacy for a treaty, and I'll truncate that by merely mentioning that a treaty campaign was led by ATSIC, building upon the final report of the Council, not negotiating a treaty, but facilitating a process for consulting uh, with communities. It's also interesting to reflect that on the 8th of November 2000, the Sydney Morning Herald reported an increase in the number of Australians who supported a treaty with Aboriginal people. So the Herald AC Nielsen poll found 53% of Australians in favour of a treaty, with those opposed dropping 6% to 34%. The poll also found that the support for reconciliation had risen. These figures are interesting because they illustrate uh, two things. One, um, well, of course, the benefits um, of, of the hard work of the council, but one, how a campaign can sharpen the population's focus on an issue that they would not normally be engaged with. And secondly, the importance of uh, leadership. In any event, ATSIC was criticised by the government for its treaty campaign for elevating symbolic measures over practical measures in addressing Aboriginal disadvantage. I mean, in part, or uh, it led to its um, demise, among many other things. But this brings us to about circa 2005. Um, and it's important to note again here that the desire for a treaty is well, uh, well and alive in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. It's at this point we witness the consolidation of the Federation's appetite for symbolic recognition. The post-Republic recognition phase leads a number of state governments to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in their constitution. Victoria in 2006, Queensland in 2010, and then New South Wales. Finally, in uh, 2013, um, South Australia also um, um, passed a an amendment. Uh, of recognition. However, each of these states uh, include in this recognition a non-justiciability clause or a no legal effect clause, stating that the parliament does not intend this section to have any legal force or effect. This is despite the fact that unlike the double entrenchment of the Australian constitution, state constitutions are mere acts of parliament. They do not require referendums for amendment. Any subsequent act of parliament can override any recognition clause. The fact that the states felt compelled to include such a clause was justifiably regarded during the expert panel consultations as a form of non-recognition. So this brings me to the back end of my lecture, and I'm sure you're all breathing a sigh of relief. 
Constitutional recognition is well and truly back on the agenda, three days before the 2007 federal election, when Prime Minister Howard announces his renewed support for recognition in a new preamble. Um, this is significant, of course, because the Prime Minister had an irrefutably difficult relationship with Indigenous peoples during his term, very long term of office. Uh, this created bipartisan support, given that the ALP policy platform at the time also supported recognition of Indigenous peoples in the preamble. And although defeated at the 2007 federal election, there has been a steady momentum in the public conversation on recognition in a preamble. I'll skip over the much maligned Australia 2020 summit, except to say that it was um, an outcome um, of the final report. Um, um, although they did note not just symbolic recognition, but substantive changes in the text of the Constitution. Following on from 2020, however, the federal government conducted one of its community cabinet meetings in Eastern Arnhem Land. While there, Prime Minister Rudd was presented with a Your New Leader's Statement of Intent, a document developed following meetings at Manangrida uh, in 2007 and other related uh, meetings over the previous 18 months representing seven homelands and 8,000 Indigenous peoples. And this communique argued for recognition of their fundamental right to live on their land and practise their culture and constitutional recognition of our prior ownership of the land and their rights. In accepting this communication, the Prime Minister pledged his support for recognition of Indigenous peoples in a preamble to the Constitution, essentially cherry-picking substantive recognition for preambular recognition, a substantial misreading of the Yule New Statement of Intent. This expression of an Indigenous vision of truth and justice by the Yule New was uh, merely seven years ago. That brings us to the expert panel in 2010, where Prime Minister Julie Gillard constituted a pa panel to report to government on possible options for constitutional um, change. It's important to note here that um, the Greens and the independent Rob Oakeshott held uh, or in their letters of agreement um, in supporting uh, the Prime Minister or the, or the government that she um, put into action um, or operationalise these uh, continual uh, indications of political support for recognition. So over the course of 2011, we conducted a broad national consultation program, which included a formal public submissions process and a, public, uh, a process of public consultation meetings. We agreed on four principles to guide our assessment of proposals for constitutional recognition. Namely, that each proposal contribute to a more unified and reconciled nation, that each proposal be of benefit and accord with the wishes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, that each proposal be capable of being supported by an overwhelming majority of Australians from across the political and social spectrums. And fourth, that they be technically and legally sound. Of course, the fourth one picking up on the unintended consequences of the drafting in section uh, 5126 in the 1967 referendum. The five recommendations were, like the Constitutional Commission, the deletion or repeal of section 25, the repeal of section 5126, we recommended that a new section 51A be inserted um, with a recognition statement as a preamble to a new head of power. So rather than have a standalone preamble uh, uh, at the beginning of the constitution because of all of the constitutional risks um, that uh, many of the constitutional lawyers we, we consulted with um, referred to, we put the statement of recognition into the preamble of a new head of power. Um, we also recommended, like the Commission did, um, a section 116A be inserted, a prohibition of racial discrimination. And fifth, that a new section 127A be in inserted, which is a recognition um, of Indigenous languages, which is really the most unpopular recommendation. So to wrap up, um, I wanted to draw together some of the insights in that not entirely comprehensive trajectory. I've outlined some of the competing notions of recognition. What does this mean? What it does mean is it means there's divergent expectations, different expectations of this current project. It explains in part confusion, misunderstanding about the current iteration 
Of course, it does not explain some of the uh, deliberate mischief, much, uh, much of it organised by uh, some members of the Aboriginal community itself. But my concern and the concern of many ex expert panel members is how is this to be managed? Non-Indigenous people frequently tell me that only preambular recognition will succeed. We're told that time and time again by constitutional lawyers, politicians. Indigenous people tell us um, that they will not support symbolic recognition. The task is not aided by the state's waning interest in reconciliation. The 1990s reconciliation was somewhat of a confected process, a political convenience that emerged from a failed executive promise to enter into negotiations for a treaty with Aboriginal people in the 1980s. Today, the contemporary version of reconciliation is focused on uh, things like employment covenants that, while meritorious, avoid engaging with the substantive question of all reconciliation movements globally, truth and justice. It's not surprising that scholars note that Australia's reconciliation process is rarely, if ever, cited in the literature on Indigenous peoples and reconciliation around the world. We saw during the Howard era, rights became decoupled from recognition, partly informed by a desire to focus on the practical and not the symbolic. Still even, the architect of uh, practical reconciliation embraced symbolic reconciliation, again, partly because of the double majority, but equally because of a genuine normative rejection of any uh, concept of, of wrongdoing. I believe the expert panel's work signified a, a major shift in the trajectory of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's advocacy for rights and recognition. The panel consisted of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people of left and right, of politicians from all uh, political parties. It's not true to say that the panel was a bunch of ranting lefties, nor is it accurate to gener generalise the panel as, as conservative. For us, Wick and Cartonieri were a conundrum. Majoritarianism trumps statute as in Wick, and the Constitution trumps statute as in Cartonieri. Section the upshot being Section 5126, as, as amended in 1967, is a problem. The ease at which a parliament without check or balance, save for the ballot box every three years, can discriminate against Aboriginal people on the basis of race troubled many during that process. The WIC amendments were often referenced, as I said, during panel consultations because it was difficult for the community to swallow almost 20 years after the fact that the very real potential of economic development and addressing disadvantage through native title had disappeared before their eyes. And I'm not referring to those that have had very significant economic development outcomes as a consequence of native title. I'm talking about those many communities that don't. Um, and because we were, we are, 2 million of 22 million people, um, uh, very few people um, raised an eyebrow. It is difficult for those Indigenous peoples that we consulted. All other comparative developed liberal democracies with Indigenous populations have adopted measures aimed at ameliorating the harsh majoritarian tendencies of minimalist ballot box participation through treaties, agreements, other constructive arrangements, parliaments, designated parliamentary seats, Indigenous electoral roles, entrenched Indigenous rights, non-discrimination clauses in the Constitution, the list goes on. Why is it that Australia, once regarded as an innovator in public policy, is incapable of conceiving and implementing similar measures um, here at home? Can I return to end on the Indigenous community's criticism of the expert panel? And this is feeding the Aboriginal resistance to this current movement. That is that we ignore the substantive treaty and sovereignty. The expert panel took seriously Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's desires for a treaty and settling the unfinished business of sovereignty. And we reflected those concerns in the report. There are two chapters devoted to that, but on the basis of the methodology that I referred to, we decided it wasn't the time to go ahead with, with those 
um, with, with, with sovereignty, I don't think can be dealt with in that process or, 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 or a treaty. Um, two, well, a number of things I would say here. Our legal advice tells us that um, uh, any constitutional recognition will not impact upon uh, Indigenous claims for sovereignty. Um, to quote the legal advice, the fact of settlement from its beginning produced institutions of government that necessarily, continuously proclaimed its own legitimacy. Given the previous presence of Indigenous people now comprising the territory of the nation Australia, contemporary legal document, uh, doctrine implies acceptance that the basis of settlement of Australia is and always has been ultimately the exertion of force by and on behalf of the British arrivals. They did not ask permission to settle. No one consented. No one ceded. Sovereignty was not passed from Aboriginal peoples to the settlers by any actions of legal significance voluntarily taken by or on behalf of the former or any of them. It goes on to say, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the constitution as equal citizens could not foreclose on the question of how Australia was settled because the reasoning uh, noted above proceeds on the basis of the common law constitutional consequences of perceived and judicially received history. That will not be altered by future amendments of the text of the written constitution. And if I can be frank, it is mischief, mischief on the part of those who proclaim the contrary. And I might add that some of them are conducting such mi mischief in the most abusive and unproductive fashion. On the issue of treaty, it was argued that communities themselves were not ready for a treaty. Some communities were. Some communities were quite advanced in negotiating with local government, state government on a number of, um, 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 the basis of a number of different forms of tenure right across Australia. But essentially, uh, it was felt that communities were not ready yet to enter into those uh, treaties. But primarily the fault we felt lay fairly and squarely at the political class in Australia. When we handed down the report, the climate was toxic, much as it is today. We felt the current class of political leadership was incapable of leading a nationwide settlement between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the state. So to conclude, I've referred to this notion of truth and justice throughout this lecture. What do I mean by that? It means the ventilating of stories of a narrative that is inclusive of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia. And if one thinks that that is already the case, then, then one really needs to get out to more Aboriginal communities. This is uh, about the frontier wars, the killing times. This is about the protection era. It is about stolen wages. It is about stolen generations. Not as just an Indigenous narrative, as an Indigenous story, but as a shared national experience and a reconciliation process that is a shared national exercise. And then it becomes about forgiveness. This process has not occurred in Australia. And my fear, many of our fears, is that the current iteration is somewhat dislocated from reconciliation, the pursuit of truth and justice. And reconciliation will require reorientation if it is to achieve the ends of truth and justice. And this includes the anger in the Aboriginal community. While normatively valuable, um, unproductive in terms of the long term, it must give way to something else. I had wondered whether I was being too provocative when I used Charles Perkins' quote, living off the crumbs that fall off white Australian tables. But I think we must take seriously the characterisation uh, in uh, many parts of the Aboriginal community of symbolic recognition as weak and insincere. And we must recognise resistance as a stance worthy of defence. Four years ago, when we comprehensively consulted communities, they only spoke of sovereignty and treaty. And I took you all the way back to post 67 and measured that trajectory where communities talked 
about sovereignty and treaty. Communities are alive to this. Truth and justice is not only what the coloniser wants or what the coloniser can convince an elite leadership into compromising on. It is also about listening to what it is that the community is saying. To label the advocates of treaty and sovereignty as radical is unfair. Those comparative jurisdictions that have engaged in this process have comparably better health and well-being outcomes. This year's Closing the Gap statistics revealed that life expectancy has not changed and unemployment went backwards. And yet the polity continues to, condescendingly so, reject Indigenous ideas based on a curious reversal of that which is considered practical and concrete in other jurisdictions, but regarded as symbolic or pilloried as, as, as a rights agenda in Australia. Yet the fact remains, we have never tried it. All of those other jurisdictions have done something we have not done, and that is grapple with our history in an open and honest way. It makes me, or when I was writing lecture, it made me reflect on a recent book review written by the inimitable Nicholas Rothwell, who was reviewing a really excellent book by a scholar, Timothy Bottoms. It's a new book on the frontier, or the killing times, called A Conspiracy of Silence. But in this review, he noted that the frontier wars were pretty much endorsed by academic experts today. He lamented that the nation has not caught up. In fact, the media is still stuck in some sort of wind shuttle era binary. But in fact, the his history has moved on. Historians have moved on. Rothwell pondered, a history once suppressed is now accepted, but not exactly embraced and enshrined at the heart of modern Australia's image itself. How could it be? Chapter by chapter, region by region, killing by killing, tale by tale. And he concluded, as I do when I reflect on this process, that so we stand gazing back on our past, on the deeds that made the nation, unsure quite what to think, how to feel, what steps to take. I am a fully fledged supporter of recognition, but what I do not want is mob backed into a corner where they feel obliged to accept another political confection. If that were to occur, there would be no revisiting of constitutional reform. We would be the one state that had gone the other way, successfully executed assimilation in a way that the state has never had to give up an inch of space in its public institutions, in its public law, to the recognition of First Peoples. Except uh, for a mere nod, or as Charles Perkins so presciently captured, the crumbs that fall off the table of white Australia. A sign of maturity will also be that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have the space to politely decline the offer of recognition. And I'm pleased that in this NAIDOC week that we have had the space uh, to cogitate on such matters and I thank the Senate for providing me the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Davis, for that very substantial and thoughtful contribution. Normally, I'd love to invite questions and comments, but I'm afraid we've uh, used our time up today. Um, we, we know that there is much to be done, and I hope that has given you lots of thought for future directions and things that we can do to achieve this goal that we must. Thank you very much for coming today.